Here's someone who never gets tired. Here's someone who's a soldier for her cause. I am so grateful to have on the show today, Miss Iraq, Sarah Idan. She is an incredible, incredible woman. She spoke before the United Nations. Uh, she's now under threat by Iraq of having her citizenship revoked because she posed in a photo with Miss Israel during the Miss Universe pageant. This is incredible, folks. This is really incredible. She is an incredible Muslim woman. She is speaking out for moderate Muslims across the globe. She's not afraid to stand up. She is the epitome of what feminism is all about, right? Or this idea, a woman that is going to stand up and change the course of things on the geopolitical stage. And I want you to hear what she had to say to the United Nations, because this is incredible. Let's play it, Madeline. I represented Iraq at Miss Universe. I posted a photo with Miss Israel on social media. I was told to remove it and forced to denounce Israeli policies. I received death threats. Since then, I can no longer return to my homeland. Why did the Iraqi government fail to condemn the threats or allow my freedom of speech? The issue between Arab... Wow, just incredible. It must have been very, very tough for her. And it still is to this day. She lives in California. I have her with me now on the line. Are you there, Sarah? Yes. Oh, it's so great to talk to you. It's it's wonderful. Thank you so much for joining me today. I think you have such an incredible story to tell. And you've done so much for so many women around the world by speaking out, not just Muslim women, but women all across the globe, women in Israel, women in the United States, uh, Christians, Jews. I want to talk. First, I want you to tell your story. Tell me a little bit about your life in Iraq, uh, mm -hmm. growing up in Iraq, and then your immigration to the United States. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes, of course. Uh, I was born in uh, Baghdad in 1990. And... Uh, uh, around the invasion, when we had the U.S. invasion in 2003, um, I started teaching myself English by listening to music and by talking to the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers outside, um, because I felt like I spent 13 years of my life living in a lie, in a bubble. Uh, you know, we had everything like controlled by Saddam, including the media, no access to the Internet. So we had no idea what was going on. Uh, outside of Iraq in, you know, in the world. And, you know, the only stations we had, there were like three stations controlled by him. So everything that we heard was through Saddam and through his beliefs or what he wanted us to believe. Um, and, you know, we've been always terrified from the U.S. because uh, as how we see it, it's like a country that just wants to... Uh, 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 to want to fight us, want to have war with us. And, you know, as a kid, you don't understand politics. You don't know why. So, you know, and people, they tell you that, oh, the U.S. is evil, Israel is evil. So, you know, when I saw the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers the first time, how they came and how they talked to us, they gave us candy and flowers. And they were, like, just one of the, like, nicest people. And, uh... So I wanted to know more because, you know, all of a sudden I see these people, they're completely different what, than what Saddam have described to us. Um, so I taught myself English and by the age of 18, I uh, started working with the U.S. military uh, as a translator um, in the green zone and uh, in uh, BIOP, which is called uh, uh, Liberty. I remember it. I remember, yeah. yeah, Liberty Base. So that's incredible. Yeah. Let me go back to that because your mm -hmm. childhood, you, you brought up something very important here. Because mm -hmm. when somebody spends their entire life being told one thing and then they see something different, that's got to be a shock to your system. Was it difficult for you to adjust to that? Or was it something that allowed you their kindness, their charitableness of the troops? Was that... Did that allow you to integrate easier 
with U.S. troops and with the idea of of the United States not being this diabolical nation that was just invading? Yeah, so um, first of all, I guess the main reason why we felt a bit strong before that about the U.S. was because of fear. You know, we've all, as a kid, I've always feared that, you know, these people, they wanted to kill me. And if I see soldiers, they, they probably want to shoot me. This is what we've, you know, we've been brainwashed, like what, what the U.S. government wants to do with us. They want to kill innocent people. This is what they tell us. So when you meet them and they're so nice to you and, uh, you know, around that time, there were many changes happening. I mean, everything was changing, everything, everything. Um, you know, there was no government, no system, and all these crazy, crazy things happening at the same time. So maybe I think that made the transition very easy because you were already like you're going through like a new phase, something that you have never, ever experienced. And you know, it's like it goes like it's all around whether the people, how they treat you, um, uh, you know, the system, the schools, everything was changing all of it at the same time. So wow. I think that made the transition easy. When you were 18 and you went to work as a translator uh, for for the United States, what was your family thinking? I mean, you know, a lot of people don't understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, Iraq, Iraq overall is a very highly educated uh mm -hmm. the beginning of everything you know so much history in your nation and you and the people of iraq suffered so much uh over the last decades what did your family think when you told them i'm gonna work with u.s forces and and translate for them so my siblings they were okay they were happy with it uh, however, my mom and my dad, they felt very strongly and only it's because what I was trying to do goes against the culture and goes against, you know, what uh, what we were brought up to do because in Iraq, it's basically most of the women, first of all, most of the women, they don't work. Most of the women, they go from their uh, father's home to their husband's home. And, you know, this is how they live. So for me to leave my home and to go live on a base with thousands of soldiers. My, especially my dad, he was so scared. He was so worried. And uh, in the beginning, when I work, I started working, they were completely against it. But I told them, I said, this is something I have to do. I'm sorry. I'm 18 and I know what I want. And I feel, you know, this is the right thing to do. And I started working. My dad did not speak to me for about three months, you know. Oh. And yes, he was he was angry with me. But, uh, you know, after he saw that I was working and I was doing a lot of great things and I was being independent and all of that, um, he he called me, he apologized and he said, I want you to know I'm very proud of you. I'm very proud of you and what you're doing, but I am, I am just a father and you're my daughter. And I was worried about you being on a base with these men, you know, so I, I completely understand it's, you know, how we were brought up. Well, that's, so. that's the issue that a lot of Americans don't realize. I, you know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. but as an American, um, my father worked, uh, in mm -hmm. the kingdom and I spent like the most formidable years of my life, uh, my childhood there in Jeddah. Mm -hmm. And so life is just different. In Iraq, it was less stringent than Saudi Arabia, of course. So it was different. Can you describe a little bit of your childhood living under Saddam Hussein, what it was like? How different was it from from now for you? Um, it was completely different. I mean, there were some good aspects, and but, you know, it was mostly bad. But because I was a child, you know, when they took out Saddam, it was only, I was only 13. Uh, but even, you know, even as a child, like, I think what I enjoyed in Iraq and what makes me feel bad about Iraq right now is that we did have security, um, so, you know, you feel safe going out, you feel safe, you, you know, th there are no, 
bombing or, you know, car bombs or any of that, you know. And, mm-hmm. and that's one good thing that we had during Saddam. But, but besides that, everything else was a mess. Uh, we did not have electricity only a few hours a day. Um, the food and the medication and all of that, it was really bad, you know. And uh, Saddam did not really care for his people. He was building his palaces and maybe developing weapons and all of that. And he left the people live in poverty. Um, we had no freedom to speak of, against him. And, uh, you know, I, I remember even if we were making a joke, like my dad would get so angry because he knows. And he said, you know, he, he used to tell us, don't say anything because and, and it is true. If you say anything bad about him and somebody uh, who works for him and he has people who work for him all over and they hear you say th- something they will come uh, after you and your family you know that was his policy he kills you and the family so that nobody comes and you know in revenge and uh, so you know as a child I did not thank God I did not experience uh you know, all these bad things that yes. Saddam was doing to other people and especially to the minorities like uh, the Shia and the Kurdish and uh, so many you know, were all slaughtered. Other people. So many huh? people, so many people were slaughtered. Exactly. They were just exactly. a lot of people don't remember this, but Saddam would would slaughter people. He and his groups, uh, his bands would go out and the mm-hmm. Shia were slaughtered and there was great division inside Iraq because of what was exactly. going on and it mm-hmm. was tearing families apart and communities apart. I want to talk to you a little bit about mm-hmm. Syria and I'm trying to bring the audience up to where I want them to hear your story because it's such an incredible story and then what happened to you recently is just unbelievable but let's Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about syria you know going to syria your life as a refugee all of these issues that you were dealing with at the time and and going back to your work as a translator um so when we went to syria i was i think 15 and uh that was very very difficult time for us because you know we were threatened uh, and we ha- we were forced to leave our home and a stranger family you know they uh, they came and they stayed in our home and we we went to syria and uh it was very difficult there to go to school to uh for my parents to work um because you know we were we were kind of like we were refugees but we're we're not like they do not consider you a refugee because we go there we apply for the un uh, but we were living there as tourists, you know, and they would, they can, like, they wouldn't give us anything like not the UN, not the UN organization. Nobody gave us anything, although they had our file in our case, but we had to go every six months. We had to drive to the borders, which was like six, seven hours. And it, it was, you know, it was very, uh, it was very exhausting. And, and, you know, during that time, I mean, Syria was not doing well financially. And I think that the reason they, they were bringing Iraqis because they wanted their economy uh, to bloom. So in a way, we were not happy and we were really missing, uh, you know, going back to Iraq. But at the same time, we know that we cannot go back to Iraq. So... Must have been a very very difficult difficult time. time Yeah, must have been a very difficult time for you and Mm -hmm. your family. Uh, Let's go. Let's fast forward right Mm -hmm. to Miss Iraq. Um, Mm -hmm. You're the first ever to represent Iraq in the last 45 years. You were the first uh, in 45 years to represent Iraq in the Miss Universe. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to do that and what made you decide to do that? And and of course, I know you have a great love for music mm-hmm. and singing. Um, that's another part of you. But what made you decide, particularly with everything that has been happening in the Middle East, to decide to do this? Um, so the first time I participated in the pageant was in the U.S. It was called Miss Iraq USA, and it wasn't really my idea. It was my sister's, <laughs> and uh, they said, Sarah, like, we think you have what it takes. Why don't you just uh, go and participate? So I, I, I went, I participated. I did not ex- expect to win, and I won. And I think the only reason I won was because of my answers, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> and uh 
then I got called for Miss Iraq. But when I called, got called for Miss Iraq and they said they wanted to send a delegate uh, to the, uh, Miss Universe, I mean, I prayed and I prayed and I said, please, God, let it be me because I know that I can represent my country at the best way that may be better than anyone, you know, that I know. Because I've already, I've, you know, I've been here for, at the time, for almost eight years or seven years. And, and that I've is here had... in the United States, correct? That's here yes. in the United States. Let me go back to that a little mm -hmm. bit, because the audience is going to, this is very, very important to the people that are mm -hmm. listening right now. You, Talk about coming to the United States with your family, what it was like for you, and how you feel about being an American and being here. Um, so the thing is, I, I, did, I came alone. I did not come with my family. Uh -huh. I came when I was 19, and I uh, went to music school in Los Angeles. And it, life was very, very difficult because you come to a country you don't know People, especially in California, most of the people that I knew, they were my military buddies in Texas and Arkansas, you know, like no one here. <laughs> um, so I, I basically I came to this strange, you know, city and like I had to build a life and it took me uh, many years. I worked every job that you can think of and, you know, I was just trying to build a future. Um, you know, but the thing is, I even when I uh, even when I suffered, even when I went through a lot and I was by myself, I never ever wanted to leave. I mean, I love you know, I love this country, and uh, I I don't think that I I've traveled a lot in my life. I don't think I've ever been to a country where I feel like I, I feel like here more at home than when I, than in Iraq, you know. Um, because it's everything, it's all these like ideologies that fit my ideologies since I was a kid. And I dreamed about coming here because I feel, um, I hear, I feel like I can, like, I'm not lonely. If that makes any sense, you, you feel there's many people, they understand you and they have the same beliefs and, uh, the same ideologies. So in a way I, when I was in Iraq, I grew up my whole life, I was, I've always felt alone. I've always felt alone and misunderstood. And I couldn't talk about many issues, but here you have freedom, you know, which I think people, they really, they take it for granted. I'll be honest with you. It's something that you cannot find in another country. Um, so, you know, for me, even when I struggled, it was worth it. It was completely worth it. That's that's a really good point. You know, we hear so much right now, especially divisions mm -hmm. in the United States. I'm sure you watch the news. You see the political mm -hmm. divide. Yes. We hear people even, uh, you know, I, I, I think there's a misconception about Muslim women. And when you see things in the news and you hear, you know, maybe even with Representative Ilhan Omar and her statements mm -hmm. about America and... I know this is not how a lot of my Muslim friends feel that are here. Um, I mean, El Haramar does not represent me as a Muslim, does not represent millions of Muslims in the Middle, in the Middle East. You know, like in Arab countries, we call her the Muslim Brotherhood. And <laughs> I, I don't know if you're familiar with that organization. No, I'm very familiar, but, but you, you explain. Know. I'm familiar, <laughs> but you explain to our, li our listeners what, what the Muslim Brotherhood is in so your opinion. The, so the Muslim Brotherhood, they are extremist Muslims, Sunni Muslims, um, who are now uh, working together with Iran against all the Arab countries. They're working now with Hezbollah, with Turkey, with all that. Uh, you know, like they, the thing is about this organization, they are extremist Muslims. They're jihadis and, uh, they have this ideology that they, they want to control the world. And they, they've been responsible for most of the wars that we have and most of the conflicts in the Middle East, they are behind it. Uh, in the main, you know, one of the, like the main countries, Iran, uh, although they're not the Muslim Brotherhood, but now they work together. Um, but Qatar is also a huge, you know, uh, how do you say, like a supporter, supporter, or a supporter yeah, financially and everything. And uh, the thing about these people, 
they come to you and I think what they're doing here in the U.S., like whether it's Elhan or whether it's Rashida or Linda Sarsour, they come, they use like, the, you know, how the how the left and uh, how the liberals, they really open to uh, uh, other nationalities. It's all about acceptance and about freedom. And these women, I think they, they try to use that to attack the country. They so they use it against that. them, using what yes, using yes. what they, what is naturally the in, initial freedoms of this country. You know, trying to be accepting, mm-hmm. trying to be embracing of of all cultures, of all aspects. But then anybody who questions anything mm-hmm. is then a racist or anti-Muslim. Folks, that's, it's that's not like all, that. Yeah, that's not, how the, uh, that's how they get the sympathy. They feed on the sympathy of people, you know. And I think I, I think that this whole thing, like I feel like sometimes that they planned the whole thing. Like they brought a woman. She's like three minorities, you know, in one. Like she's Muslim. <laughs> she's black. She's an immigrant. If you say anything, you're anti-immigrant. You're a racist. You're Islamophobe. So you cannot really attack her. And she's very well spoken. It seems like she came here like she already knows what she's doing. She came with on a mission every time I hear her speak. And it's so like it really angers me as a Muslim that when she gets asked about uh, uh, condemning terrorists and she's like, oh, I refuse now. I refuse. No, I, I'm not. Or FGM. Uh, I, I, you know, I saw that a while ago. And FGM and that's has, not, female uh, gen- has nothing one to second. do with Islam. One second, you know? Sarah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes. That's female genital mutilation. Yes. It is not part of uh, Islam overall. Many Muslim women, this has never happens. It does happen in some parts in of Africa, Africa yeah. and mm-hmm. North Africa. It's not something uh, it's it's condemned, of course, mm-hmm. by so many people. But then you'll see people that are saying it's part of their culture or part of their religion. And I want I want you to explain it, the moderate Muslim woman. You say okay. you mm-hmm. say I'm a moderate Muslim woman. Most most listeners don't understand what that means. They've been they've been shown one thing, but mm-hmm. but they don't understand it. So explain to them what that means. So so a moderate Muslim is uh, basically you believe in God, you believe in Muhammad, um, you believe in being a good person, you believe in the judgment day in heaven and hell. But we, I do not, for example, like I do not pray five times a day. I pray when I can, <laughs> you know, I'm not like, I'm not religious. Like I, I, and I don't think that we need And many people, all the, all the moderate Muslims, they want to separate the Sharia from uh, the government and they want you to have freedom. And it's basically like, you know, being a Christian, um, but not very religious Christian or being a Jew who is not a very religious Jew. You believe in God and you believe in all of that, but you you just don't, like, for example, I don't believe that God is concerned with what I'm dressed, you know? You and believe in the secular it, state. Yes, you know, because there's even, like, chapter, you know, chapters in Quran that says that God does not look to how you look and how you dress. That's actually, listen, it looks to your heart's, and what do you do? And I believe in that. I believe God is like not concerned with our looks. You know, I mean, we talk about us as humans and we sh- say we shouldn't be that shallow and judge people by how they look. That's and, right. Uh, and this is know, something that so, I don't think a lot of Americans understand. A lot of Americans don't realize because they're not seeing this. They're seeing one side of this. They don't mm-hmm. hear the moderate Muslims like Dr. Kanta Ahmed, like you and others who mm-hmm. have come out and said, look, I don't even wear hijab, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a woman. I'm going to fight for rights. And that's where I want to just bring you because I know I'm going to have to wrap this up. And the most important part of this whole interview for me is that mm-hmm. you stood up to the government of Iraq. And you went to the United Nations and you spoke to the United Nations. I want to talk about the picture that you took with Miss Israel and how it led to all of this and to the fact now that the Iraqi government is threatening to take away your citizenship. Um, So, you know, I took the photo when I took the photo. I had no idea it was going to be this big. I never, ever 
thought that. You know, and when I took it, I guess I was thinking my American mentality because she came to me and uh, Adar. And she was scared to approach me. And, you know, when I asked her, she said, you know, because I'm from Israel. So I, I felt really ashamed. And I told her, I said, you know what? I said, if anything, uh, uh, like we need to show the people that we are against that. We are here to promote peace. And, uh, you know, we're like peace ambassadors. So we took the photo together and... You know, I woke up the next day with Miss Iraq, with my family, like my phone ringing in messages. Uh, the Miss Iraq organization, the first thing they did, they threatened to take my title. And they say, you sided with a country uh, that's uh, an enemy uh, to Iraq. And you need to make a, a statement saying you do not support their policies. And that was while I was, you know, in the pageant in Las Vegas. So I had to make this statement. And I said, you know, this is just a, a message to spread love and the coexistence. But I do not support the Israeli policy. But I was basically forced to say that. And the minute I was done with the organization, I deleted that post. And then I just started speaking more and more because before that I had no idea that there was a huge anti-Semitism. I, I, you know, I grew up in a loving family and, you know, although, you know, we had war with Israel, but we never had war with Jews as religion. And I, I basically, when I started getting all these hateful, hateful comments and messages that talk about them, like they dehumanize them, they describe them as, as monkeys and pigs, and they say they're not even human and they deserve to die. And then I began to see that extreme, you know, the extremist Muslims. And, you know, I understand when you say that, you know, many Americans, they only get to see one part of Islam. They don't get to see the moderate. But, you know, I kind of, I, I don't blame, blame them for being so uh, cautious because we do have a huge, huge level of extremists that needs to be fought. But unfortunately, uh, here in the U.S., we have the wrong representatives. We need moderate Muslims who are not tied with terrorist organizations that represent our country. And That's to so fight to these women who try to act like they are representative for Muslims because they are not. Where does it stand now? Sarah, where are you at now with the situation with Iraq? I mean, and I know you've also received mm -hmm. death threats. So I, you know, it's, this is a very serious situation, folks. This is, she has chosen to come forward in a, in a, in a geopolitical storm now. And everybody is just, and I know I'm using that word over and over again today because that's what we're seeing all across the globe. Things are shifting and changing. This is, this is a whole podcast about foreign policy issues, but she has really been targeted for standing up, for standing up for what she believes in and for standing up for peace. So can you explain where you're at right now um, and what the situation is like? Um, this situation, the Iraqi government refused to make any comments. Um, I, uh, I had, I think, uh, CBS. They uh, contacted the Iraqi uh, embassy. They did not answer them. I, I did not contact the Iraqi embassy. I mean, I'm still worried. I wouldn't even want them to know my phone number or where I live. You know, wow. I, I do not trust it because I feel like the Iraqi government right now is a representative for Iran. They're not even representative for the Iraqi people. And everything that I've been saying, everything that I uh, stand for is against the Iranian regime. Um, so this is why... Um, I, I think they, they could have stripped my citizenship. I never contacted them. If you can contact them, <laughs> let me know. I absolutely <laughs> will contact them. Mm -hmm. And Iraq, I am going to keep contacting you, the government of Iraq, until I get an answer as to what happened with Sarah Idan's citizenship. Um, you're also a U.S. citizen, correct? Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And your family is still in Iraq, correct? No, no, uh, they left to they another left? Arab country. Oh, yes, okay, yes. thank God. They had death threats. So yeah. under death threats, mm -hmm. they had to leave Iraq. Think about this, mm -hmm. people. Think about what it's like to live under these kind of threats. And think about how lucky we are as Americans to live in such a great country. Sarah, exactly. I could talk to you for mm -hmm. hours, 
for hours and I'm going to bring you back on the show. I think your story is amazing. And next time we can get more into details about what happens in the Middle East, what it's like living as a woman in the Middle East. And maybe you can clarify for people, you know, that may be misperceiving what it's like to be a Muslim woman. And I thank you so much for your honesty. I thank you so much for being mm-hmm. with us today. And I hope people really listen to this podcast because it's so important for us to understand each other And it's so important for us to understand where we're coming from so that we can avoid conflict and that we can find solutions. Thank you, Sarah. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you. Such an incredible interview with Sarah Dawn. She is such a brave, brave woman. I don't know how to express my I grew up in the Middle East. I have so many Muslim friends. I spent most of my career traveling to South Asia and to the Middle East, where Islam is the primary and dominant, of course, religion. And I can't even begin to tell you how brave Sarah Idan is. Some of the things she said on this podcast today, if she said them even in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia God only knows what could have happened to her. You know, she's very brave. She's telling her story. She's standing up for women all over the world. We need to support her. We need to listen to her. We need to tell her story. This is important, folks. We need to support women like Sarah Don, who immigrated to this country, who love America, who want to be a part of this great American fabric and give so much back to this country. These are the women and the immigrants that we should be supporting and backing. And I, you know, I could have talked to her forever. I know I've been talking forever. I'm going to have to wrap this up. I promise you I'll be back next week with another update on James Comey. And we'll get that report out to you as fast as it comes out. Michael Horowitz is going to have his report out on Comey anytime now. Please go to SarahACarter.com. That's SarahACarter.com for all the latest stories. I can't wait to be back with you next week. We are taking back the story, folks, and this is where the story begins. Thank you for joining us.